Good afternoon and welcome all to this London Festival of Architecture digital event. I'm Ellie McKenzie from Carry Communications. The theme for this year is power and today's discussion will be about learning from nature to empower structure. Later this summer, a new pedestrian bridge to provide secure access to the world's first dinosaur statues will open at London's Crystal Palace Park. Today, the team behind the project will talk about the history of the iconic site the learning potential for design and architecture from nature and natural forms, and how this project will help bring the story of science and its artistic representation to life. Today, we are joined by Mike Tonkin, director of Tonkin Lou, Eleanor Michel, chair of Friends of Crystal Palace Dinosaurs, Stuart Chambers, senior structural engineer at Arup, and David Knight, director at Cake Industries. Throughout the discussion, I encourage you to ask questions in the comment box, uh, which we will then ask to the panelists at the end of the discussion. Um, and now I will hand over to Eleanor. Thank you, Ellie. Um, it's really a pleasure to welcome you guys here today because it's a very exciting time uh, for the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. And my, my role is just to spend a few minutes um, setting the stage. And uh, I wanted to tell you um, for the few people who uh, might not know what the Crystal Palace dinosaurs are. Um, we have Mike's just bringing the, the slides up. Thank you. Um, many of you know that uh, the, the world's first great exhibition in 1851 was a beautiful building called the Crystal Palace. It was then rebuilt in um, uh, South London. Can we bring up the first? I don't think I have control of these. Right, okay, there we go. This is uh, an engraving from 1854, a slightly fanciful illustration of what Crystal Palace Hill with the beautiful glass house on the top of the hill looked like, uh, more or less, much larger than the installation in, in Hyde Park that had been built in 1851 and then taken apart and reassembled on the top of the hill. This building was perhaps one of the most influential in architecture of the time and its effects are still being, being echoed today. And the project that we're doing is actually part of that echoing, echoing process, um, not perhaps so much in the design of the actual structure of this beautiful bridge, um, but in the aspect of, of learning from nature and, and, um, re and reflecting that in the form of, of the built infrastructure. So that's the building at the top and the massive fountains that you see cascading, cascading down. We'll just sort of ignore those for a moment. Um, but at the lower end of the screen, what you see is some large forms of, of dinosaurs and then small people walking just, just along there. Um, and today, that still exists. Those, those sculptures were built at the time, 1854, and there are over 30 of them. The, the pride of the, uh, of the sculptures is on a series of islands, normally kept from the public and best viewed from far away. Um, but they, we, we need regular access in order to maintain this historic asset. So next slide. And here they are um, in the background, the lumbering uh, land dinosaurs in the foreground, some marine reptiles and these beautiful structures, um, which are classified as buildings, but also are sculptures in and of themselves. And Friends of Crystal Palace Dinosaurs is dedicated to conserving this beautiful set of sculptures built by uh, an artist, and sculptor named Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, we could have the next slide, um, who wanted to uh, convey a, a basically a new idea in Victorian times of visual learning. And what you see here is a sketch from Waterhouse Hawkins um, where he shows from left to right, younger to older in a geologic time series, which is basically a geologic walk through time. And he constructed this site as experiential learning is a fancy term we would use today. At the time, he coined the phrase of visual education. Taking that one step further, here's another sketch of his, uh, where you can see the deepening of the message. So the idea is you first walk through and experience this site, your as a kind of an entertainment, edutainment, but then as you learn more and feel more about it, you can, there are layers of science and history and art that are revealed through that. And this is Waterhouse Hawkins sketch that shows a bit of the geology, the names of the animals involved, and tells you a bit about all of these things um, in the site. 
Okay, next slide. Next slide. So the sculptures are still there today. Um, there are 30 of them out of the original 33. However, uh, at a, getting close to 170 years old, they're made of concrete and they require regular maintenance and they tend to crumble if they have that. This is one of our conservators inspecting some of the damage that we noticed years ago when we first formed as an organization. Next slide. Next, next. Uh, is it? Um, do we have a next slide? Okay, there we go. Um, this is our photogrammetry team taking pictures of recent damage to the iconic Megalosaur sculpture. Next slide. Um, as part of our conservation monitoring. So once we've noticed that there are problems on the island, we have to actually get there and do some conservation work. Next slide. Is it, is there, next slide. Mike, are you? Um, yeah, I thought I was controlling it, but uh, um, yeah. There we go. Here's some conservation work to give, also give you a sense of scale of these enormous structures. Um, so there's work ongoing there. And in fact, somebody in the audience, I believe, is, is one of the people pictured in this, in this uh, slide here. Welcome, Mark Porter, conservator. Um, next slide, please. Um, and we also want to inspire the next generation of, of, of conservators. So we want to outreach to tell people about why, why conservation need, work needs to be done, how it's done, the fascination of material sciences, and um, just have generally an interesting experience on the island. These are in structurally controlled access situations. Next slide. We can need another slide. Is, have you pushed the next slide? Is there, is there another slide? Yeah. Um, um. There we go. Um, we also do volunteer engagement through, oops, it's okay, don't, don't worry about it since it's a bit of a problem. That was a picture of people gardening. We have teams of people who go and do a volunteer engagement gardening project on the islands. And um, then I want to reflect back to the original source of design and inspiration. Um, and in Victorian times, uh, there was a discovery of a fabulous water lily called the Victoria Regina. And um, here it became a fascination of Victorian culture, the flower of empire occasionally called, etc. cetera. Um, next slide. And we now take this inspiration, well, the, the inspiration was taken by Joseph Paxton for the actual building of the Crystal Palace, next slide. And it was a, a sort of a beginning of that moment of using the natural world as an inspiration for form. So um, we had a problem that the access of the islands was removed a number of years ago, about four, four year, three and a half years ago. And um, we're not able to do conservation outreach or, uh, or the other work that needed to be done on the island. And so we uh, approached our friends um, at Tonkin Lu and said, can we build a small pedestrian bridge to solve this problem? And we found a way to fund that um, through the, uh, an offer of a grant um, that had to be, uh, was competitive, a competitive grant through the Greater London Authority, the GLA. Um, and that required crowdfunding and we had enormous outswell of support. We had actually over 600 and I think it was 30 people who contributed not only to this um, crowdfunding platform here through an auction. And then we also had a number of, of um, businesses that contributed and have, have worked together since. So we had considerable pro bono from major, uh, major organizations, including, including Tonkin Lu, including Arrow, uh, including Cake Industries, and then a number of, of other support sources. And of course, we also um, reached a pretty great deal of fame when we had celebrity support from Slash from Guns N' Roses, who loves the dinosaurs and um, was supportive of our campaign and uh, brought in lots of new followers for the Crystal Palace dinosaurs. Um, the people who are doing the real work here, uh, the architects, engineers, and fabricators, thanks. Thank you, Eleanor. And so I'm going to uh, kind of run you through the sort of context of in a way, Eleanor sort of set the scene there that this project's very much about kind of learning and teaching. 
and actually as teachers we learned a lot through um, teaching at Westminster where we ran a master's unit uh, where we were teaching particularly uh, the technique we developed with Arup 10 years ago called shell-laced structure. Um, that had a kind of evolution of its own and led to sort of many projects um, and um, it's recently led to uh, a few of the students who were our students at the time, so Alex Woolgar, um, he, uh, he was the project architect for um, Hull Solar Gate that sort of tells particular moments in Hull's history through those um, um, oculuses that are in the perforated skin. He was also the project architect for the stent that we took a patent out for a few years ago, which is for the trachea. Um, and Matt Burnett um, was the project architect for the Swing Bridge, but is also the project architect for uh, Manchester. This is a picture from the Manchester Evening News a couple of weeks ago. Um, this will be uh, what it's like in a couple of months. Um, and then this is what it'll be like in January uh, when the wall gets added. So, so Shell Lace has led to a kind of number of projects. And when Eleanor first asked us to look at the project, we had to kind of just come up with a solution that would kind of um, put the bridge into context in, uh, uh, with the dinosaur. So this was where the existing bridge used to be. Um, and um, it could let people know that it was sort of leading to Dinosaur Island. And it also showed a kind of trap door in it, was, which was supposed to be the gate. Um, so as, as when, when we finally found the project was real and the fundraising had been um, spectacularly successful and the GLA had uh, given its support to, then um, we almost sort of started again. And um, each of our projects is always a story. And in a way, in the first part of uh, our process, which we call asking, looking, playing, making, the asking bit is trying to kind of trying to find the riddle. And in this case, the riddle was, um, how do we bring people um, to the island and um, but with, that, with a bridge that isn't a bridge? And how do we bring um, people sort of closer to nature in a way that they kind of understand the, con the context of, of the dinosaurs? And also, is there something we can do that kind of learns from that context? So this is a singing ring tree from many years ago. Um, and that uses a wind to make a sound. So here we didn't, we decided that maybe the best place to put the bridge wasn't actually where the temporary bridge used to be. And um, so we looked uh, uh, the site a little bit more carefully. In a way for us, it was very important what Eleanor had said about the kind of technical context of the Crystal Palace. And also the, the, the um, transmitter mast is also a sort of a thing of elegance and beauty that's very important to local people. So there was definitely a kind of technological context and definitely for us, the context of kind of nature and evolution. Um, and so there was a logic into looking at the plan. And once we understood that the islands were laid out in a geological time, it raised the question, well, what came before the dinosaurs? And um, so it, it, it asked us the question, well, how can we get onto this island without making a bridge that is a bridge? How could it be something different? So we tried multiple options, which is what we always do. Um, and one of those options, um, this one here, was a bridge that actually stayed in the water as if it was a fish. So um, it, and that way we would make a kind of secure crossing. So um, the fish was kind of inspiration in quite a few ways to us. So one of the first ways is that a fish has a backbone. And so if you have a normal bridge and you have abutments on two sides, then you'd probably have two beams. But if you have a bridge that has just a, as a and it's going to be a bridge that swivels, it's going to have just one support and that's in the middle. So in that case, it just gets one beam. And it makes sense for that beam to then become a torsion beam in a kind of triangular form. I mean, once you've made it, it makes sense that the beam sort of starts to follow the job it needs to do. So it gets bigger over the support and smaller at its ends. And then um, so that will give you a kind of um, a form. And it made sense that the bridge lifted up from the low banks and was higher over the center. So it gave us an arch in the center. So the compression ends up in the bottom of that arch and the tension in the top. And the triangular form made sense because you need less material for tension and more material com for compression. And it also kind of followed the bending moment diagram. So going back to the fish again. So the beam, we have the backbone. Um, before the backbone, we kind of looked at the fish and this is when we were kind of still looking at the idea of the gate. And um, we, when we looked at the gate, we said, well, we could kind of laser cut the gate and laser cut some pieces a bit like a comb. And we said, well, what if we use a kind of the idea of a comb and take a comb and turn it three-dimensional, a bit like if you were making a Chinese lantern. So if you took a comb and bent one piece up, that could be the balustrade, and one piece down, it could be a strut, you could leave one piece 
that would be straight. So you have a kind of shaft on a comb and it becomes a bit like a beam and the different teeth can then do different jobs that the bridge needs to do. So that's basically what we did with the kind of, we made a kind of comb. Um, and what was good about this, it was a very thin sheet of steel and it meant from one sheet of steel, you almost got the entire bridge bar the beam in the center. So if we take that beam and then put onto that beam, the comb, um, the bridge, the beam is a kind of double cantilever. And by adding two combs to it, we're adding two more cantilevers away from the beam. So all of a sudden we get a kind of filigree bridge that's made out of two combs on top of a beam, like a rib cage on top of a backbone. So we have this in cross section um, with a balustrade. And then the next thing we said was, well, what if um, we look back at nature even before the kind of earliest fish, there were kind of flatworms and the flatworms and the earliest fish like a, a picara or a lancet, they move through the water by moving sideways and that sideways movement actually gave uh, energy, propelled them forwards. And um, that same energy, you can, you can use the same kind of undulating form to actually make something stiff, as well as making something move, it can make something not move. So if you take a simple piece of paper, and this is something we learned from Shelley's structure, and you pull the top curve straight, then you get a, a, an undulation at the bottom. And if you fix the bottom piece, then actually you make something that's actually very stiff um, because it's locked in place. So when we're making things, we, uh, we're nearly always making models. And I think this model took something like 20 minutes and it just kind of confirmed that actually it made a very stiff structure out of straws and staples. Um, so we then applied that idea of the undulation to the idea of the comb. So the comb meets the undulation and all of a sudden the kind of bridge um, becomes, um, has its own sort of entity, it's become a kind of idea. Um, and the way it works, just to explain that, is that if you put a load on a bridge, when you push, it's like a buttress, it resists it. Um, but what happens is the ones that are slightly further along in the undulation, they become in tension and they kind of pull. And actually, if the opposite happens, if someone pulled on the bridge, then the opposite thing happens. So this plate we're managing to do here is just a 10 millimeter plate um, out of which we can make kind of three elements of the bridge. So it's incredibly kind of economical um, and the plate is actually very thin. And we played a lot with the amplitude of these waves and it made sense to put the biggest amplitude where the support was in the center and the smaller amplitude where the bridge got narrower um, where you get onto it. Because in a bridge, everybody always stops in the middle and um, that's where they kind of have a look and that's where you want to pass each other. So it made sense that the center of a bridge was wider and the end of a bridge was narrower. So the amplitude is the same proportion, but it follows as it goes, goes down, it changes, it changes size. So the pitch changes as well, along with the proportion. So we have, this is the kind of cross section. And then the balustrade is also a sort of laser cut piece. And that laser cut piece is also curving in plan and curving in section. And Stuart is gonna kind of explain what happens to the balustrade as a kind of structural piece um, in terms of uh, um, it, what it's doing, uh, resisting the forces. So then the latest model we made was the, uh, the one that we then exhibited at the Royal Academy and we were lucky enough to win the uh, material prize in last year's summer show. And that was photo etched from a piece of kind of one mil aluminium. Um, what we learned from that model, whenever you make a model, they're always out of date because when you finish the model, the model has taught you a lesson that you're going to change it. So it's a little bit like evolution. You sort of, you get there and then you move on. And this one told us that actually it was too complicated. There were too many undulations. Um, so in a way, the whole process for us is a little bit like Darcy Thompson's evaluation of fish for different climate, for different conditions. Um, our bridge too has kind of been through an evolution and it has evolved as, it's, um, as those conditions have changed and it's kind of reacted to what's happening on many levels. So, so I'm going to hand you over to Stuart in a second, but just we put back into context. So this is where the bridge is now. And a lot of you are wondering, well, how do you get to it? Well, the idea is that there's a chain and there's a chain that leads to the bridge and that chain is locked so that you can't pull the bridge to you or away from you. And in the middle, it has a, um, a stopper and that stopper stops it rotating. So you, once you've unlocked it, you can pull it towards you and then you can lock it in position so that when it's going to be used, people can use it freely without it worrying about it spinning off again. And, um, um, and um, Stuart's going to be able to tell you how many people can get on that bridge. Um, but when the bridge is generally in this position, it's going to be kind of like something left in the water. And when it's open, 
which will be a, a supervised activity when the maintenance is taking place or the children or school children or educational visits are going to be, then there'll be a kind of supervised visit. So um, um, I'm going to hand you over to Stuart um, from, from our now. Hi there. So um, to, to answer Mike's question. Um, Stuart, by the way. <laughs> um, about 40 people can stand on the bridge. Um, so it's designed for, designed for quite a load. Um, and whilst being a very delicate looking structure, it is actually um, quite robust. So um, similar to Mike's description of the bridge, the story of how the structural diagram was solved was also somewhat of an evolution. Once it was decided that we wanted the bridge that swung on a central foundation within the water, we looked to other similar concepts for inspiration. One of those concepts was, were canal swing bridges. Um, unfortunately, we found that the bearings used on these bridges, whilst long lasting, wouldn't allow for a tension on one side of the bearing, um, utilizing different means to resolve that. Um, and as we wanted the least complexity possible for this bridge, um, our search continued. And we were soon led to a bearing known in the industry as a slewing bearing. Um, this is a picture of it here. It's essentially a sealed cartridge bearing, similar to what you'd find on an excavator. This type of bearing could generate the overturning resistance needed and would allow a single foundation in the water to be used. It required little maintenance and could be replaced if needed. And it could of course rotate on the plan through 360 degrees. Um, back one slide, sorry, Mike. Sure. Um, the diameter of the bearing was of great importance to Tonkin Lou, um, as its size could have considerable impacts on the visual aesthetic of the bridge. Um, as a structural engineer, larger diameters were preferred for the bearings um, because this gave a stiffer support and would, with the larger lever arm would lend itself to less connection force. Um, but as you'd imagine, it was a case of the smaller the better for anyone interested in the visual aesthetic of the bridge which did include us as the engineer, funnily enough. Um, so we managed to get a modest bearing size of 470 mil to work. This being the smallest size we could achieve for the bearing before we started to, be, started to need specialist connection between the bridge and the foundation. Once we'd agreed on the bearing size, our focus turned to the bridge itself. We wanted to allow Tonk and Lou the greatest level of freedom when it came to finding the exact form of the bridge they desired. As you'd imagine, a small tweak in the geometry could have a significant impact on forces within the, within the bridge. Um, Tonk and Lou could easily sketch up hundreds of forms, and we'd of course need to check all these forms. Um, so we created a parametric script um, using Rhino and uh, Grasshopper and a plugin geometry gym um, that would allow us to talk to our analysis software and rapidly generate a, tech, um, a host of different bridge forms. Um, which then allowed us to inform an envelope which Tonkin Lee could use to derive their most desired bridge form. Um, once we honed in a solution that we all liked, we could then undertake a very thorough analysis of the bridge to ensure that the bridge would not be ever stressed and would have, of course be comfortable um, when you walked across it so that it wasn't too bouncy if you walked across it. Um, next slide please Mike. And so this is a, an image of one of those analysis models um, showing the, the frequency of vibration um, that you get when you walk across the bridge. Um, so then the next slide, please. Um, so the bridge relies on many members acting together to share the load. All the members are in fact extremely slender and could, e could easily buckle, but only if they were loaded on their own. Like the spokes of a bicycle wheel, the members of the bridge all act together, allowing very high resistances, resistance to be achieved. When we undertook these parametric studies, we found that the smaller we could make the members of each um, individual member of the cone, the smaller we could make those, the more members we could fit per meter length of the bridge, and the overall strength of the bridge would actually go up, converse to what you might think. Conversely, if we used larger members, we couldn't fit as many members per meter length of the bridge. And we found that actually the force from loading, for instance, someone pushing on the handrail or someone standing on the bridge would concentrate on individual members and cause that member to fail 
and therefore the bridge to fail. Um, so because of this, we sized members as small as we could to the extent um, just before the point where we'd start having issues of people, if they kicked it or, um, or jumped on a, on a member, on a single member, that it would fail. So we tried to make the members as small as we could so that it could act as much like a bicycle wheel in an efficient way. Um, the structural principles of the bridge were actually quite simple. Um, you can see here the, the diagram and cross section. So essentially, people standing on the bridge generate a tension in the deck and a compression in the deck struts. And if you have more people on one side like this, um, the torsion that results is taken in the central um, stiff beam, the, the spine beam. Um, and of course, when people stand on the deck, um, they also generate a bending force in that member, um, just as you would if you stood in a plank of wood in a piece of decking. Um, uh, so the, the form of the bridge was tailored to match the forces. Um, so you can see here the bending moment, which is the force that you get in the spine beam, um, is largest at the center because that's where the support is. And as a consequence, we made the center of the bridge deepest and the ends of the bridge shallowest. Next slide, please. Um, so um, the trickiest bit for us um, came about when we tried to understand how we generate stiffness and strength <laughs> in section here it's much easier to understand basically when you push on the handrail you get a push pull in the balustrade struts this force then makes its way through the stiff central beam and into the foundation in the ground uh, next slide please um, next slide um, but as it wasn't possible to resolve this push-pull on a single point, um, we used the waveform of the bridge to, to provide the ability to generate this push-pull in a third dimension along the bridge length. Um, and this was achieved by utilising the Virendil bending resistance of the balustrade members to take the force in the tension zones below where you push the handrail and allow that force to move to the compression zones. Um, in effect, we were creating a similar load path to what you'd get if you had a solid skin of steel for the balustrade infill. Um, and if you go back one slide, please, Mike. Um, and this shows how out of balance load is handled within the bridge. So um, the bearing essentially takes the force from the, from the central beam and allows it to be transferred through the bearing into the foundation, um, which offered a really robust means of um, resisting load for this bridge. So if, for instance, um, someone tried to swim out into the water and then jump on the end of the bridge when it wasn't gaining support from the, um, the banks, then they couldn't break it. And equally, because of that, when it swung into the bank position, we didn't actually rely on a foundation um, at the bank. So it means less foundations to dig um, and a simpler, more robust um, means of construction, constructing the bridge. Um, so that's it for me. I'll, I'll hand over to Dave. Thanks, Stuart. Um, uh, and and uh, interesting to hear from both Mike and Stuart about the, the, the background and the story behind this, this structure. Um, Mike, if we go on to the first slide of, of mine, please. Um, Cake Industries is a fabrication uh, firm, uh, design and fabrication firm based very close to where the bridge uh, is due to be installed. We're, we're a mile and a half away or something. And, and, and one of the joys for us is being that close to the site. We're acting both as, as fabricator and as main contractor for this project. Uh, and it's been a, a, a real, um, a really interesting project to, to get our teeth into um, uh, and, and, and keep it going. One of the main uh, challenges um, having taken a design from from Arup and Tonkin Lu um, and one of the main challenges was to uh, ensure that this the bridge itself was was simple to fabricate a lot of work had been done before we were involved um, but the the impact of the, the fabrication process on that was something that we were able to help with the key was to distill this design uh, down into elements that could be manufacturable from from entirely flat pet plate um, and the only point in this this project where we 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 um, added any 
heat or added any mechanical aspect to the bending to create the curved form was in this, this cone structure. Um, we ordered uh, several tons worth of flat 10 millimeter thick cut uh, laser cut plate uh, and water jet cut plate um, from, uh, from a supplier, uh, MTech, um, which arrived on a, on a large pallet in our, our workshop. Next slide, please, Mike. This was then um, uh, formed uh, manually to create the, the sculptural forms that uh, are required to, to, to create the shape of the deck. Um, this bending process was something that the, the prototype that you saw earlier was, was key in, in generating uh, and a, a way of doing it. Um, it involved using an oxyacetylene torch. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. Which was used just to heat up the roots of the bend. Um, and you can see here um, our, some of our, our workers heating up the root, root, of, the, root of the bend uh, to just over 600 degrees. Um, that gave the, uh, the leg of the comb or the, the, t the, the tine of the comb um, enough flexibility that it could be moved by hand. And if you go to the next slide, please, Mike, you can see this being bent into place uh, to, to match a template. And this gradual process allowed us to move along a laser cut comb. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and generate these six pieces, uh, comb-like pieces that uh, uh, match the, the sculptural form that we were getting in the, uh, in the model from, from Tonkin Learn from Arab. Uh, next slide. Uh, these pieces were then um, brought uh, onto the, the central spine beam, which have also been fabricated in our workshop. And you'll see more of the, the fabrication process in the video that we'll show at the end. Um, uh, they, were, they were brought up and, and welded, onto, uh, welded onto the central spine. Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, Mike, this was then finally finished. Uh, all of the, um, uh, the tines uh, finally uh, moved into their, their final position with the, with the handrail added on top. Uh, and everything was dry fitted in our workshop. Next slide, please, Mike. This was a, about a two month uh, process in the workshop. Um, and one of the great joys for us at, at Cake Industries was, um, was getting uh, our staff who, who live locally involved in fabricating a project um, that, that will be part of a local park uh, uh, for many years to come, we hope. So here, here they are. This is Marnie on the left, um, Quinn, Ed, James, Ollie, and Carwin, all of whom were um, keen and excited to be working on this project. Next slide, please, Mike. One of the um, really interesting things from our point of view um, was that this bridge uh, uh, did not have a a standard protective coating. Normally on a bridge you would put a very high specification paint finish to keep it protected from uh, corrosion over time. In this case we worked very hard to make sure that the bridge could be um, hot dip galvanized in one piece. So the bridge is eight meters um, uh, long uh, and about uh, 1.8 meter, 1.7 meters tall um, and that meant that it was just small enough that it could fit in the longest uh, galvanizing bath there is in the UK. Uh, and so this is it being dipped in, uh, in one piece into the galvanizing bath in Chesterfield. Um, and if you go to the next slide, Mike, uh, this is it after it had been removed. And this process of finishing means that in one, um, uh, one leap, one process, we can create both the decorative and the, the protective finish to the piece of structure. Um, it only just fit in, uh, fit in the bath, so we were very, very tight on, on uh, tolerances and uh, on shape and size, um, but we're delighted with the, the output uh, and the, the quality of the finish is very good. Um, this is currently where the bridge is sitting. Uh, it will be moved down from Chesterfield to site as soon as site is ready. Unfortunately, we are on a slight pause uh, due to um, coronavirus at the minute, um, but we're hoping that over the over the summer we'll be in a position to install this uh, install this bridge on the on the foundations that we're about to start putting in. Um, Mike, I think if we can now put the video up, uh, that's the end of our. Um, uh, presentation but it's an opportunity to take questions uh, from the audience.
Thanks for that, David. I don't know if you're able to, to share the, the video with us at all, Mike. We have a couple of questions in already, but if anyone else would like to ask questions, then do feel free to um, ask them in the comment box. Um, and we can um, read them out for the panellists. Um, so um, the first question we've got is from Reginda Sodi. Um, Reginda says, I live 90 seconds from the Dinos and class them as neighbours. Very supportive of the bridge, but have some fears about the bridge possibly increasing vandalism of the structures. What strategies are being thought about in this area? So I guess that's a question either for you, Mike, or for Eleanor. I'm I'm happy to start with that, um, or unless Mike, you want to talk about the security of the bridge itself, and then uh, I'll give you a wider comment. No, I think in a way, you know, what we've said about the bridge being locked, and then you can't get to the bridge unless you have a key to the padlock, and um, I'm sure it's going to be a mighty padlock. So over to you, Eleanor. Yeah. Um, so there are no, there are a number of answers to that question. Um, so the first piece of context is that there has always been pedestrian access of a bridge um, to the Dinosaur Islands until it was removed in 2016, 17, when the, when the hydrology works were done. So um, there have been ways to get onto the island. They have had various kinds of security in the past, like a, um, sometimes just a small gate. Uh, in the distant past, when there was a zoo, the entrance to the island was through the penguin uh, cages. So people didn't go that way, but you could easily get there. Um, and access, basically foot access is needed to do things on the island. Otherwise the, the site will just completely, will completely crumble. Um, and that has a, a two-sided two -sided need. One is the actual physical processes of doing grounds work and working on the sculptures. Um, and then the other is outreach for, for people that have have them have a feeling of ownership of, of the island itself. And that's become more and more important these days um, than it was in the past when responsibility was just taken over by, for example, the, the council or some, some governing body. But now, now things really fall into a public sphere. And you have to have a, really a groundswell of support um, from the public and a sense of ownership for, for things to take off. Um, so, in the process, we're, we're, we're reinstating an access that has always been there that is lockable. Um, we also, for the first time, will be uh, have an agreed protocol um, for access and numbers of people at a time, number of people over the year, basically a method that's that's been agreed. And that draft agreement was part of our application to Historic England who are very um, sensitive to the fact that the islands themselves are not designed to have lots of people on them at, at, at lots of moments in time. Um, uh, then there's also the, the, the real world um, constraint that in order to get funding to work on the sculptures and to maintain them, you have to have access because no funder is going to actually give you funding for a site that you can't get to and where the maintenance won't be carried on in the future. So that's the background aspect of, of why we actually need to have that bridge reinstated. The question of vandalism is really um, a salient one at the moment since we've just had some very serious vandalism on the island, um, or at least it seems that way, but that is combined, the sensitivity of those sculptures is combined with the fact that they become increasingly delicate if they're not maintained. So um, the reason that Megalosaurus sculpture fell apart, um, you saw the, the problem with its head in one of my early slides, is because there hasn't been ma maintenance done over the last uh, 18 years or so, or, or so on, well, yeah, approximately 18, 18 to 20 years. So had the maintenance been done, the occasional incursion onto the, onto the island would probably be able to be maintained. And people also, with a sense of ownership, with a sense of sort of civic of pride, will put the pressure on keeping people off of it. So the idea is that you give, give a sense of ownership to the to, uh, local people. And we found that that actually does work um, in that when, when there are incursions on the island, we get told on social media and we can do something about it. And we've been in consultation with the Met Police 
um, about how we can improve the security on the island. Um, it's a tricky, tricky thing. And the fact is there have, there, you can never keep everybody off the island because it's, um, uh, it, 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 anyone who's really intent on getting anywhere will get there. I mean, we know that the top of the shard has been accessed. Um, so there's a certain point where you, you can't keep absolutely everybody off, but by creating a visible and uh, delineated barrier and access, you improve, improve security overall. And part of that security is the sort of, uh, the knowledge about it, the, the, the sense of ownership among the, the public that's in the area anyway. So I don't know, is that enough of an answer for your question? Great, uh, thank you, Rajinder. <laughs> and, and the next question is from Kate McGreevy. And Kate asks, has a bridge like this ever been made before using the cone technique? And what is the largest span that this technique could be used on? Um, so I guess that is a question for, for Stuart or Mike. So um, as far as we know, this is quite an innovative solution. We haven't seen it used before. Um, in terms of the spanning capacity, so um, a lot of the spanning capacity is done through the central beam, the triangular extrusion. Um, so if you wanted to make that big enough and um, deep enough, then you could span quite away with that. Um, in terms of the actual deck elements, they can't lever off that central um, support. So, you know, uh, depending how how deep you go, then um, they could go some way as well. Um, the width of the bridge is about two meters um, and it's length eight meters. So um, it's not the kind of form of construction you would use for a long span bridge across a river, for instance. Um, but it was very suitable to the scale um, and offered the balance of you know creativity and innovation with um, achieving a very simple goal of getting people from one side to the other, whilst allowing people, not increasing the ability for people to be able to cross the waterway. Great, thank you, Stuart. And from Andy Scolds, I guess it's kind of a follow on from that. Um, Andy asked, there looks like there's a lot of fatigue points on the bridge. What inspection regime does the bridge need and what is its design life? Fair enough. So um, tricky question from Andy. Um, so, um, to date, the bridge has been um, designed to the NSSS, so the, the National Steelworks Specification. I mean, so far we've done 10% of um, material particle inspection, so that's kind of a, uh, a non-destructive way of testing if, you're, if you've got any fatigue issues in the bridge. Um, we check the natural frequencies of the bridge um, to make sure that it wouldn't resonate with wind, for instance. Um, so the kind of amount of load cycles you get from people walking over the bridge or from wind making the bridge move isn't enough to cause fatigue issues. Um, so, and as David pointed out, we've made sure that this bridge, bridge could be galvanised. So it's expected that um, the bearing whilst will need to be greased um, about every 12 months. But other than that, it should be maintenance free. You shouldn't need to paint it. Um, there certainly shouldn't be any fatigue issues. Um, the whole um, basis for the design was minimum maintenance. Great, and actually Stuart, we've got another question for you from Deanna, and Deanna asked what software was used for the structural analysis diagrams? Um, so we used the diagrams I showed on my slides were just hand sketches, um, but the analysis software we used was Arabs in-house software, it's um, Oasis GSA. Great, thank you. Um, and the next question is from Keith Brownlee. Um, and Keith asks if you can speak a little bit about the abutment and the opening procedure. Shall I take that one? Um, uh, the abutment uh, on, on either bank is a very lightweight structure. It's obviously not taking any, uh, any load in either position. So it, it's just a slight reinforcement uh, of the bank to mean uh, to. To, to end the path uh, uh, as you come up to the bridge and then you step onto the bridge. Um, what the abutment does do is, is um, provide a, a, a solid point to hold the bridge um, from rotating as you're, you're on, the, on the bridge. It's a, it has a steel hoop essentially with a pin that is dropped through uh, and locks the, uh, locks the bridge in position. 
In terms of opening procedure, uh, given the scale of the bridge, it's a very manual operation. Um, the chain um, in its uh, open position, i.e. The, the bridge is in the middle of the water, um, just sits on the bottom of the um, bottom of the lake and is locked in position and locked off. Um, and then to open the bridge, uh, or to, to make the bridge possible to pedestrians, uh, you unlock the padlock, uh, uh, lift the chain out of the water and give it a tug. Um, given the lever arm involved, the, the, the actual um, force needed to do that is well within um, manual capabilities. Uh, pull the bridge around until it is uh, appropriately uh, aligned, drop the pin into the, the hole and locate it in place, uh, and then wander across to the, the dinosaur bridge, uh, to the dinosaur island. Great, thank you. And also, um, Keith also asks, uh, what's the cost against area? It's a, um, a, a rather a moot point on this. It's not very comparable to uh, existing commercially uh, driven projects because we, we started with a very um, fixed budget, uh, what was raised by the crowdfunding, uh, and then everything else was um, donated by uh, Arup or, or ourselves at Cake Industries and Tonkin Lu in terms of time. Um, but it, uh, it's comparable to um, equivalent uh, sculptural footbridges, um, and given, given the cost and given the area, we're looking at about seven to eight thousand pounds a square meter. Thank you. And I've got a question from Mark Porter. With the water level changing, will this affect the bridge in any way? And finally, why was the location changed from its original position? I can pick that up. As yeah. I can pick no up worries. the water level if, if that's okay. Um, the, the water level, um, the, the, the bearing for the bridge is designed so that it sits above the water level. Um, adjacent to where the bridge is there is a weir so we know where the, the maximum water level is because after that level it will pour over the weir and into the lower lake um, uh, and the water will then descend from there and you'll see more of the concrete and um, pier in the middle of the, the water um, and I'll let uh, Mike answer the question about um, uh, the location. The, yes the, thank you David uh, the original uh position of a temporary bridge is actually very close to one of the dinosaurs and so we felt that the bridge there was going to be a, a planning issue because it could be seen that the bridge would do harm to the existing um, historical setting. Also that happened to be a longer span so by moving it to the other end of the island had the advantage of making the bridge much shorter so it was better for economy. Um, it um, also was quite nice, but actually for ch school children, that was the beginning of geological time. And for us, that was a really important po point too. And the whole idea of the kind of fish came first and then reptiles and dinosaurs. So, so there were sort of several reasons for it. But uh, it's also a more sort of discrete position as well. I think that that is a, a good point as well. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, and we've got a question from Catherine Schlag. Oh, sorry, yes, Elena. Yeah, has a point. Mm. Additional comment on the water levels. Um, so the, the, the problems with the water levels in Crystal Palace Park overall have been identified by Historic England as, as a really large issue. And they've commissioned a hydrology survey that's, uh, that's ongoing now. For those of you who are local, you may have seen pontoons taking pours in the last few days. Um, and the plan is to have a a very large uh, overview of the hydrological connections within the park so that we can source the water better um, and make sure that it doesn't go to the low levels where it is now. And um, then we were, we're also pushing to get the uh, waterways dredged and with the dredging that'll, that'll um, remove the risk. So in some sense, all of these, these projects will sort of be mutually supporting each other. And once we get a bridge in, shows a, you know the commitment to all of that and and we can actually push forward and get the uh, hydrological work done faster um, and with you know with more with more oomph behind it from um, the, the uh, statutory organizations that need to take charge of those kind of things so it's all a kind of a work in progress and mutually mutually reinforcing great thank you Elena um, and then the question from Catherine Schlag, she said, it's very fascinating. I just wonder about the floor of the bridge, how wide the gaps are and whether dogs or children can easily walk across. Um, Mike, if you're able to skip back a few slides, there's actually a shot with the flooring um, yeah. as shown. Um, uh, 
and it's, it's paused on my screen on, on a shot of a, a shot of the open bridge. So yes, I can understand the question. Uh, the intention is to um, uh, to add a uh, there we go an expanded metal mesh over the over the over the bridge itself, uh, which is then um, clamped down to the the lateral uh, uh, deck struts. Um, uh, and held in place, so it will still be transparent, but you won't. You will. You will be able to to walk freely on the expanded mesh. The expanded mesh also gives you kind of good grip for a wheelbarrow, so they're going to be going backwards and forwards. And another nice outcome is when um, it doesn't show here, but there's some really lovely pictures um, from James who um, that show the sort of shadows of the mesh on the beam, and all of a sudden they become like fish scales. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, and then we have another question um, from Virginia. A uh, question for Eleanor. Um, are there any plans for another auction? We really enjoyed the first one. Well, that's great news. Um, yes, there is. Um, but probably not for bridge stuff. Um, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to fix the Megalosaur. And we had appointments yesterday, most of the afternoon with Historic England, and on Friday we have some more. And then in the cause of getting something done, whether it's a small scale or a large scale conservation effort, um, that's an ongoing thing. And we have had an, just a, a, a groundswell of support from the community. A lot of creative people have offered uh, things that they've made um, in, for an auction. So we're getting geared up to do it. And if you're local, we might actually find you and see if you might want to help with the actual auctioning process because it's a lot of work. Um, so anyone who wants to pitch in on, on our next run, round of fundraising, do make yourselves known to us because we're happy to bring more people on board. And it, it's really um, fun, but it's also really exhausting to do this kind of stuff. And I want to take the moment to, to make sure that there's recognition for the rest of the Friends team Friends of Crystal Palace Dinosaurs. Um, when we did the fundraising for the crowdfunding, it was a, basically a three to four month process. And when we were in the intense three months of, of raising the funds, it was sometimes most of the day spent doing, doing something around that. So um, it's, crowdfunding is really not for the faint hearted. If anybody suggests you to do it, um, it's fun, but it really takes a lot of energy. Uh, it, it builds your people. It's wonderful, um, but I, I would I would say that um, that's only because we had a really good team behind it, and uh, a few of them are here now from the from the um, from the board. A few of them couldn't make it just at this point, but um, we've had we've had you know they all all deserve recognition, and I'd like to say especially um, Charlotte Whitewick um, is one of our board members who spotted the grant that was made available by the mayor, the GLA grant, and volunteered to do the first drafting of that um, and to run that. And I think it, um, she deserves credit and it also should be um, emphasized to everybody that it just takes one person stepping forward and making a commitment to push on something to then start the ball rolling and make a bigger thing happening. So um, we had, we had a, a a number of other people, core people on the bridge team. Um, Sarah's our social media person who brought it all alive to the public. And Alison Smith has been our project manager who's been working basically for the last, uh, whatever it's been, 14 months with our bridge team, meeting almost weekly on, on the topics of getting these things happening. So, um, and then the rest of our board as well. But I, it's, it's really something that takes a lot of effort. So, um, yeah, sorry. Sorry to make that a little bit of a bigger question than you than you wanted, but um, we welcome anyone who's who's got the energy to make things happen. Come join us. Well, there you are, Rodinda. You know that you can uh, join them if you're interested. Um, and then we've got one final question from Namra Saqib. Um, Namra asks, "What are the methods for the internal damage detection of bridge structures?" Yeah. Um, so in terms of uh, before the bridge is erected. Um, as I pointed out before, we, um, we've done a material, um, MPI test on 10% of the structural connections and where it's been welded or, or bent. Um, so that can allow you to see if you've got any minute fractures within the steel, um, which could propagate into something serious. Um, obviously it's past all those. Um, and we have, of course, done 100% visual inspection on the bridge. So 
um, Dave and his workers and myself have gone around and checked that um, every well, every bend on the bridge um, is satisfactory. Um, the protective coating that covers the outside of the bridge, the galvanising, um, has also covered the inside of the bridge. So if water was to make its way into the inside, um, it's protected against corrosion. Um, so in terms of um, damage, it's either through rust or, or fracture, um, both of which have been covered. That's great. Thank you all so much. Um, and I just guess one final question, which I think um, a lot of people will want to know is when, when will the bridge be complete? Um, I'll take that and I unfortunately will give a rather unsatisfactory answer and um, we're pushing as hard as we can to get it in um, ASAP. Uh, I'm hopeful that by autumn you'll have a, a bridge to cross. Uh, if, if we can get it in earlier, we will get it in earlier. That's great. Well, thank you, Mike, Eleanor, Stuart and David. Um, if anyone else has any questions, then please do feel free to follow up with us after the session um, and we're happy to ask the project team. Great. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.